All right. Um, so I think we can probably start. So um, welcome to our first Home Dialysis Journal Club of the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, today uh, presenting will be one of our second year nephrology fellows here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, uh, Dr. Naif Abudaf. Um, he's going to be talking to us about the prompt study. Um, a quick reminder, and I see Lindsay included this uh, in the chat, uh, for the folks at Vanderbilt, we now actually offer CME credit. So uh, the fellows that are on or attendings from Vanderbilt who are on, if you put in the CME code um, that Lindsay put in the chat, 63207, you'll be getting CME credit for uh, today's uh, journal club. And uh, without further ado, Naif, take it away. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Naif Abadef and I'm a second year nephrology fellow here at Vanderbilt. I just wanted to take a minute and say that I feel incredibly privileged and honored to be able to speak to such a wide audience today. Um, many of you in the audience have never met me, but a lot of you are still my teachers. You're people I kind of look up to. You're people whose works I've read, referenced, or cited and learned from. Um, some I've actually cited in this presentation. So thank you again for allowing me this opportunity to present and speak in front of you. Right now, it's been sort of 58 weeks and four days since I started fellowship. So I'm no longer in the infancy of my nephrology career. I'm actually a nephrology toddler. I've graduated a bit. And uh, with my wisdom as a toddler, my newfound wisdom, I've learned in the past year the importance of perinitis prevention in PD patients, really like proper education, technique, exit site care, managing wet and dry contaminations, early recognition of symptoms. But what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is something that I feel is underscored less in the PD community. It's something that we don't pay much attention to because we implicitly know to do it, and that's timely antimicrobial management. And today, in a much broader sense, what I'm talking about is really the challenges of providing good in-hospital care to PD patients. And the study uh, to sort of illustrate this talk uh, that I've chosen is the PROMP study, or the relationship between the presentation and time of initial administration of antibiotics with outcomes in peritonitis and peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, I have no financial disclosures, but I do have some biases that I need to disclose. This cartoon right now is a representation of me. I am absolutely terrified of PD-related peritonitis. Um, toward the end of my first year, I've seen an anomalous amount of bad outcomes of PD-related peritonitis. I've seen, you know, patients who have died, ended up with recurrence with another organism or a fungal organism, relapse, transfer to hemodialysis, kept on PD but required a catheter exchange, and it felt like very seldom was I seeing medical cure. Right now, as a second-year fellow, I'm more afraid of being called about a cloudy effluent than I am for oligaric renal failure and hyperkalemia with EKG set changes. Um, I can fix that potassium of 7.5, but with perinitis, it feels like I'm powerless. I'm watching a train wreck in slow motion. Uh, I felt very hopeless for a period of time, and it wasn't until I reread the study that I realized, you know, I found hope again. I found that this study shows an area of improvement and a potentially modifiable risk factor to bad PD-related perinitis outcomes. And I hope you do realize that what this group did in Western Australia is something that we could all possibly do in our own programs uh, to address something modifiable in peritonitis and potentially improve outcomes. Uh, the outline is not different from any other presentation. We'll talk a little bit about background. Most of our time is going to be talking about the study. I've included two follow-up studies since 2016, which was the time of the original prompt study publication, uh, to help make, make my case. And then at the end, we'll open the floor to discussion. Uh, so this was from the peritoneal dialysis outcomes and practice pattern study. The reason I included this slide is to say that we in Ameri North America do a really great job at prevention. Um, 
in all the cuts in all the countries studied in the PD PDOP study, um, the peritoneal dialysis peritonitis rates were not that bad. In Australia and New Zealand, which is where our study centered, uh, the rate was about 0.35 per patient a year. But as we'll come to learn, there's a lot of significant variability in regions and even in dialysis units. We all know the diagnostic criteria of PD-related peritonitis, um, but I'd like to tell you how I think of it. I like to think of it as clinical, lab, and microbiologic, and you need two out of three to make the diagnosis. I feel when you're ordering a cell count in culture, you've already met the clinical criterion, and then you're just looking for the cell count, whether it's positive or negative, or seeing if something shows on the gram stain because the culture takes too long to result. Um, the one point I wanted to make with the clinical criterion is really the importance of visual inspection. A cloudy effluent should prompt immediate treatment after an adequate sample was obtained for cell count and culture. The reason being is because the number one cause of a cloudy effluent is going to be culture positive peritonitis, and the number two cause is going to be culture negative peritonitis. The specificity of a cloudy effluent in a PD patient for peritonitis is about 95%. We really shouldn't be waiting on the cell count to tell us our patient has peritonitis. We should be treating sooner. And it's often better to be right than specific. That being said, there are other things that can cause a cloudy effluent. Um, and they're listed in table four over here. Uh, the lab criterion, we need to have more than 100 leukocytes with neutrophilic predominance of greater than 50%. The reason I don't like the cell count is because, you know, there are a lot of things that affect the result of the cell count, and you really need to know the way it's been drawn. Ideally, you should have a two-hour dwell. Anything less than that can cause a false leg negative um, because you might not have enough total cells. You might get false negatives in patients who are on automated PD because their dwell times are not as long. And you really have to think about when that sample was obtained and when it was sent to the lab. Uh, Dianeal, the pH is about 5 to 5.5. Even with 1.5% bags, the glucose concentration is about 1,400. This is not you know, an area where, where our cells tend to thrive. They tend to lice, and you might be able to get a false negative result. And a study from 1991 showed that about 30% of cells lice within four to six hours of the sample being drawn. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the lab turnaround time. The sample may have reached the lab an appropriate amount of time, but the result comes back four to six hours later or three hours later. Um, and that all delays treatment. For the microbiological criterion, the only point that I wanted to bring across in this is that ideally less than 15% of PD-related peritonitis cases should be culture negative. Uh, in this particular study, in the PROMPT study, they really wanted timely administration of antimicrobials to their patients. So they often did less than a two-hour dwell, and they considered any neutrophilic predominant um, effluent cell count as positive, even if the white cell count was less than 100. So for example, if the result were 88 cells and 70 of them were neutrophils, they considered that as meeting the lab criterion in the study. So why do we care about PD-related peritonitis? I mean, I think the Reasons why we need a care is pretty obvious. It causes hospitalization, which is costly to our healthcare system. It is the number one reason for technique failure in transition to hemodialysis is uh, PD-related peritonitis and infection. And it has a mortality rate of about 4% per episode. In the PROM study, it was a bit higher. Other people will quote anywhere between 2 to 6%. Uh, but regardless, peritonitis can cause death if left untreated, and even if treated appropriately. So the impact of time to clinical outcome is of established precept in infectious disease. Um, the chart on the left is about early goal-directed therapy. That was a big thing in the early 2000s. It was a six-hour resuscitation protocol for patients tailored uh, toward their presenting sort of 
uh, towards their presentation, they would adjust fluids and vasopressors according to CVPs, according to central venous oxygen saturations. But what they noticed was nothing mattered as much as timely antimicrobial management. And the graph on the right, it shows uh, patients who are septic, who developed hypotension and their mortality rate if there was any sort of antimicrobial delay. And as you can see, as time goes on, you know, after a certain num of, number of hours, it feels like mortality is essentially fixed. Does that hold true in peritonitis? And uh, back in 2016, the ISBD that recommended that antibiotics be given empirically immediately after obtaining cell count and culture. We knew to give antibiotics, but it was based on a sort of low quality evidence. It was a grade one C recommendation. It wasn't until the prompt study came out and the 2022 guidelines came out that that recommendation became a one B recommendation. Uh, the prompt study really helped identify a relationship and support the importance of timely antimicrobial and and administration of antibiotics that helped describe the relationship between timing of therapy with harder clinical outcomes like medical cure, technique failure, and death. I'm honestly a big fan of the changes in the 22, 2022 guidelines uh, because they suggest that now instead of giving the antibi antibiotics uh, intraperitoneally, you should give antibiotics as soon as pass possible, even systemically in IV if need be. And I feel like a lot of time might be utilized, you know, ordering the intraperitoneal antibiotics, taking time to have it compounded in the pharmacy, having it sent to nursing, having the nurses administer the antibiotics intraperitoneally. So I feel like this was a good change. And now without further ado, we're gonna be talking about the prompt study. I don't usually leave a slide to just talk about the title and design, but I really had to for the study. The study stands for the relationship between presentation and the time of initial administration of antibiotics with outcomes of peritonitis in peritoneal dialysis patients. I feel like it's an accurate description of the study. The title tells you exactly what it's about. It's an observational study. It's looking at time of antimicrobials and outcomes in PD-related peritonitis patients. And I feel whoever picked out the acronym did a great job. It's really catchy and it has a double meaning and it's really unforgettable. Uh, Dr. Abra meant a comment, made a comment. The fear is large, but the frequency of PD peritonitis in high performing US centers is low. And cited the PDOP study, the best 25% of US centers had peritonitis rates of 0.14 events per year or less. And I think that's a great point and something that I'm going to talk about in my next slide. So, about the study, it was a study that was conducted in Western Australia. Perth was the metropolitan city in the area and region. The study occurred between 2012, August, and July of 2014. According to the Australia and New Zealand Dialysis and Transplant Registry, 19% of their new starts start on PD, but only 8% remain on PD after five years. In all of Western Australia, they had 1,144 patients, and of them, 320 were on PD. What's interesting about Western Australia is all patients on PD there are trained and managed by Fresenius, and all of their care were supervised by three tertiary care hospitals. Um, in the study, they reported their peritonitis rate in episodes per patient months, which I found weird. Uh, we typically report things in patient years. Uh, the way they reported their rate was one in one uh, episode for every 21 months, uh, one episode for every 21 patient months. Uh, so that's about you know, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 episodes per patient year. This was more than the overall rate of peritonitis in Australia at the time in 2012, which was 0 0.38 episodes per year, and more what we'd find acceptable according to the ISPD, which is less than 0 0.4 episodes per patient year. Um, I have two reasons why I included these graphs. The first uh, was to show the difference in peritonitis rates 
among different regions on, in Australia. Western, Western Australia was a troubled region that had higher rates of peritonitis. And the reason I included the figure on the right is to really reiterate the importance of prevention. As you can see, there were quite a bit of dramatic changes in the rates of peritonitis between you know, pre-2010 to the most recent data from the Australia and New Zealand Transplant Registry 2012, 2020. Uh, you know, it goes to reiterate what Dr. Abra was talking about, which is an ounce of prevention is really worth a pound of cure. Um, so this is what I found to be the most impressive part of the study. Statewide, they all followed the same protocol um, for intraperitoneal antimicrobials. Everybody who had suspected PD-related peritonitis got two grams of vancomycin and 200 milligrams of gentamicin. They all had the same sort of training, exit site care protocols, and although we don't do this, they did nasal decolonization uh, with mupericin there. Um, they had pre-hospital notification. So Fresenius made a 24-hour hotline for suspected PD-related peritonitis uh, cases and patients could call at any time. And depending on the time they called, depending on their symptoms, if there was any sort of clinical ambiguity, they designated them to go to either an ambulatory care facility, of which there were two, or a metropolitan hospital or a more rural non-metropolitan hospital. What they defined as metropolitan was less than 100 kilometers from Perth and a non-metropolitan hospital more than 100 kilometers from Perth. Um, whenever there was sort of diagnostic uncertainty that persisted, they usually sent them off to hospitals. Whenever it was more straightforward, they sent them to, to ambulatory care facilities. Uh, again, they looked at all of the patients since they could. Everybody there on peritoneal dialysis was part of Versinius. Uh, and they had a total of 159 peritonitis episodes in 116 patients after excluding 19 cases. That's a typo. They excluded 19 cases. Uh, the data that was collected was primarily collected by nursing staff, but the physicians uh, sort of checked the accuracy and to resolve any ambiguity of some of these results. And the three variables that they looked at was symptom time to contact time. So that's the time of recognition of the first symptom to the initial time health, a healthcare provider was contacted. The second variable they looked at, which we'll come to learn is the most important variable, particularly in the hospital, is first healthcare provider contact to initial antimicrobial therapy administration. And then they looked at the sum of symptom time to treatment time. So time from initiation of symptoms to time antimicrobials were received either intraperitoneally or IV. Uh, and that was a sum of the symptom to contact time and contact to treatment time. The outcomes that they looked at were PD cure, PD fail, which was a composite outcome of catheter removal and death. Uh, when they were investigating the contact to treatment time, they also investigated it as a continuous variable, but also as a dichotomous variable. So whether or not antibiotics were administered within four hours or, and whether or not antibiotics were administered after four hours. The reason this was chosen is because uh, statistically it made sense when they looked at the data and because that's when they have to make a decision for admission and uh, according to the Australian Hospital Demer Emergency Department policies, four hours is usually the time period whether they need to decide someone needs to be admitted or not. There were two episodes that they did exclude, exclude from the study uh, because they felt like it was unlikely patients with peritonitis who had a contact time to treatment time greater than 120 hours. So this is the flow diagram. I think it makes more sense if you start right in the center. They had 178 episodes of peritonitis. 19 of the episodes were excluded. 
the reason they were excluded was because four had missing outcome data. We didn't know whether they developed PD fail or not. 11 had missing times, so they didn't know what their contact to treatment time was. And four episodes were fungal peritonitis. Um, and overall, when they looked at the patient outcomes, about 121 episodes ended up with medical cure, what we call now, or 76%, and 24% uh, ended up transitioning to hemodialysis or dying. Uh, this was their table one. The points that I wanted to make in this table was the time on PD. The median duration was 13.2 months with a first quartile of 4.9 months and a third quartile of about 30 months. So it's a good mix of you know incident PD patients and prevalent PD patients in the population. In the prior peritonitis, about 20.1% had prior peritonitis. And this isn't, you know, ever having prior peritonitis, but this is peritonitis within the 157 episodes that they collected. What I did find interesting is about a third of their patients were in automated peritoneal dialysis, whereas two thirds were in ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. To me, it usually means that one of two things, either they underutilize automated PD in Australia, or it goes back to what's suggested in the PDOC study, which is, you know, patients who are doing CAPD may be at higher risk of getting uh, PD peritonitis versus automated peritoneal dialysis. Sorry, no, if I don't mean to interrupt, just for accuracy's sake, for the other fellows that are listening, I mean, um, they're, they're both prevalent is just how prevalent. None of these are incident by definition. Thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Olshami. Um, so they're presenting symptoms. Most presented with a cloudy effluent. Abdominal pain occurred in about 72%, 91% presented and complained about a cloudy effluent. And about 63.5% both had abdominal pain and a cloudy effluent. Um, again, in the study, they treated everybody who had suspected uh, peritonitis. They didn't wait on the cell count to confirm the diagnosis, and 89% of the time they were right. The patient did present with PD-related peritonitis, and they got antimicrobials in a timely fashion. Um, the reason I have table two here is there's not, there's no significance in terms of outcome, whether it's gram positive or gram negative, but to really illustrate the point that they had a high culture negative rate. So the culture negative rate here was about 30%, uh, which was a lot higher than where I expected it to be. Ideally, as the ISBD states, it should be below 15%. Dr. Wallace said that there are cost differences of automated versus manual. To understand the difference in prevalence of automated versus manual, you really have to understand how it's paid for. 100% agree. And Dr. Olshami also 100% agrees. For these patients who have their affluent collected, uh, they were collected when they went to the, the, the ED or the hospital or the Ambulatory care facility, yep. So I'm, I'm not sure why their rate is higher than where we expect it to be. I don't know if they were utilizing blood culture bottles back then. I don't know if they inoculated it appropriately. I can't tell you why. It's just something I noticed. I, I, at the beginning, did you say that they did, they actually didn't follow the guideline definition of peritonitis, like their definition was? Their definition was a bit different in terms of the lab criterion. So. Uh, if the dwell was less than two hours, you might end up getting less than 100 cells. So there they considered anything with greater than 50% neutrophils as positive. I mean, I guess their definition was slightly less. It's more sensitive, less specific. Well, uh, the other thing too about leaving the fluid in for a certain amount of time has to do with getting the bacteria there in a quantity that is uh, growable. Okay, so that, that, that's why it's not just uh, time to get cells, it's time to get bacteria as well. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Golper. And that might be another reason why they had such a high culture negative rate.
In terms of outcomes, um, 10 patients died and 28 patients had their catheters removed. So a total of 38 patients or about 24% of episodes led to the primary composite endpoint of death and PD catheter removal at 30 days. Uh, most of the deaths, interestingly, or sorry, the deaths were interestingly attributed to cardiovascular causes in two patients, biliary complications in one patient, sepsis in six patients, and one patient had an unknown cause of death. Two of the patients who did die had their uh, catheters removed prior to death. Uh, table three over here talks about the patient characteristics and the clinical variables uh, compared to the composite outcome. In terms of the no significant associations, there was no significant associations between PD fail, age, time on PD, automated PD versus uh, manuals, presentation, in or outside working hours, whether or not they're diabetic, whether or not their exit site was abnormal on presentation, whether or not they're primarily Caucasian or Aboriginal, their geographic location or their presentation. What was significant were three variables. One was the presenting symptom, the other was sex, and the third was time to treatment. Um, the presenting symptom being cloudy effluent seems to be associated with a more favorable outcome. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in women that they observed, uh, the odds ratio for developing PD fail was almost three times as much compared to their male counterparts, so 2.9 times. And uh, when they looked at contact time to treatment time, which is, you know, their dichotomous variable of more than four hours and less than four hours, uh, the odds ratio of developing PD fail for patients who were treated more than four hours upon contact to that healthcare facility, whether it's a hospital or an ambulance facility, was about 2.5. So that means, you know, in this, in this particular study population in Western Australia, the patients who did present to the hospital with suspected PD-related peritonitis and received treatment more than four hours from initial contact, they were two and a half times more likely to end up either dead or transferred to hemodialysis at 30 days. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because, you know, looking at some of these values, these patients were treated pretty rapidly. They were treated on the basis of suspicion before a diagnosis was even made. They didn't wait for the cell count like uh, we often do. They all had pre-hospital notification before they arrived. You know, people were ready to treat these patients uh, before they even got to the hospital and ambulance facility. And it really shows when you look at their symptom time to contact time, symptom time to treatment time, and contact time to treatment time. So like the median time of recognition of symptoms to presentation was five hours, you know, uh, 5.6 hours in the patients who developed PD fail. And uh, the contact time to treatment time was 2.3 hours in all of the patients, about 3.4 hours in the patients who developed PD fail, and two hours in the patients who ended up developing medical cure. I find these numbers to be, you know, great. And um, the other point that I wanted to get across is if you look at, you know, the actual median time from contact to treatment, the people who ended up with medical cure, if they ended up at an ambulatory facility, it was one and a half hours from time of presentation to ambulatory facility, two and a half hours if they went to a hospital. And for the people who failed, it was two and a half hours from presentation to an ambulatory facility and four hours from presentation to the hospital. It's interesting though, because you would think, um, yeah, contact, when the study contact time to treatment time, right, gives you the p value that you want, but you would assume that at the symptom onset is really when when the clock starts and the p values there, zero point seven three, zero point four eight. So that's an excellent point that you brought up, uh, Doctor Oshami. And uh, one of the articles that I'm going to be talking about, I think, from 2021, was a Japanese study which talks about symptom time to treatment time and shows an actual difference between initial onset of symptoms to treatment. And uh, that's going to be when we reach the cross-examination towards the end.
but why they didn't find a difference in this particular study population, I can't, I can't tell you. Oh, and, and Osama, you know this as well as I do. Uh, our definition of symptoms is pain uh, that brings you to medical attention. And that's different than pain because patients deal with denial for hours. Oh, that's not real pain. Oh, and, and we know that because we say to them, uh, if you have pain, don't you think you ought to drain and look at the fluid? And if they're on cyclers, that fluid is very dilute anyway, so they can't tell. So and we don't have that many patients on uh, manual exchanges, but denial is a key part of it. So the, the symptoms that you guys are referring to are symptoms bad enough for them to contact the doctor and say, that's when my symptoms started. Yeah, but shouldn't you expect the four precisely yeah. that that should have a significant effect at the moment that they start recognizing the symptoms to the moment that they initiate therapy. So the clock should start at the moment that they are complaining very badly. Exactly. Right, It's it, you're looking at a subset, right? So my stomach hurts, right? My stomach hurts for 15 hours and your stomach hurts for 15 hours, but I showed up to the emergency room an hour later and you showed up 12 hours later, right? And then you die and I don't die. Does that mean that, you know, the three hours in the emergency room is what killed you? It like, we're looking at a subset of that time. And somehow when you start the clock earlier, it doesn't really matter. So what's happening in the hospital or at the time of contact, that's, I mean, I don't know, it's the exposure to the organisms there. I, I don't, I don't really, I can't explain that you're just starting the clock earlier. And like Dr. Urbari said, and like you said, Dr. Goper, right? Yeah, uh, all, all, here's all I'm saying is yeah. that when a patient has an inkling of abdominal pain, and, and the fellows know, because I talk about pain from their chin to their pubis. Mm -hmm. If they have pain from chin to pubis, you look at the fluid, you drain the fluid and get it. That's, that's all I'm saying is my admonition. Yeah. I guess the a possible explanation could be if patients are highly sensitized from, you know, they know that if something happens, they need to go. So some have much lower thresholds than others, and that can dilute the sample a little bit. I, I don't know. Uh, the other thing is just about who really went to the hospital. I, you know, if a large number of these patients had clinical ambiguity or severe symptoms, they were directed to the hospital, and that might cause a selection bias. Yeah, but that is a big problem and flow of this study. I didn't want to say that until the end, but you started the fact that uh, how do you explain that is the contact time that makes a difference? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I that don't is a major, big, big flaw of this study, major one. Anyway. All right, Naive, sorry, go ahead. Um, so the next slide is a uh, box whisker plot. I'm not really a fan of this box whisker plot because the scale throws everything off. I feel like they should have just, you know, done each an individual um, a sort of variable that they were looking at individually so that you can best compare things to. Um, but essentially, again, the median symptom time, the contact time in patients who presented to the hospital compared to ambulant facilities uh, it was 4.6 hours compared comparatively the ambulatory care facilities was 7.8 hours. The contact time to treatment time was 2.8 hours at a hospital versus 1.7 times at an ambulatory care facility. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because I will come to find out later the patients who did develop PD fail who had uh, contact to treatment time delay were predominantly in hospital patients. It wasn't the patients presenting to an ambulatory care facility. And this suggests that patients presenting to an ambulatory care facility are getting there later. And although they're getting their treatment faster, the entire duration of uh, treatment might be greater from symptom to treatment. Um, I didn't do a good job at explaining that. So I think I'm gonna move on to the sort of next slide uh, to help illustrate that better. Um, I think when we sort of separate and tease out everything individually and you look at 
ambulant care facilities in green versus in hospital uh, in this orange type color. Uh, you can see that patients who presented to an ambulatory care facility, even though there was no clear statistical difference between them, uh, tended to spend more time between initial symptom to their contact uh, compared to people who went to a hospital immediately. Uh, there was a significant difference in terms of contact to treatment time. Uh, patients who went to an ambulatory facility were treated much quicker than patients in the hospital. And that was likely because, you know, it's a home dialysis facility. They know exactly what to look out for. They have the antibiotics, they're ready to treat versus if they go to a hospital, they might not have the education or knowledge uh, about how to approach people with suspected peritonitis. Um, when they did a sort of multivariable model, uh, patients who presented to community centers, there was really no difference between contact and treatment time. That didn't really make much sense. But people who did present to a hospital uh, who had delayed treatment uh, were more likely to develop the PD fail. And what they said was, you know, for each hour of delay in a patient who presents to a hospital, uh, their odds of developing PD fail was increased by around, you know, 6.8, 6 6.3%, 6.3% uh, 6 if you exclude the patients that didn't meet the diagnostic criteria for peritonitis. And um, it, for some reason, the patients who did present to the hospital did worse. Uh, Dr. Abra said, likely select population going to the outpatient PD, less severe peritonitis. They can get faster treatment in outpatient facility, as you can say, as you just said. And I think that's an important point, right? Uh, you know, as the patients are calling in with symptoms, someone's making a decision. Is this patient sick enough that they need to go to the hospital or do they seem stable enough that we could see them in the outpatient unit and we have someone there at the time to treat them? So there's, there's probably you know, a little bit of selection that's going on there uh, as people are as people are calling in. I also love on this figure, they have a little magnifying glass to <laughs> help you see the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the line of identity there at one. <laughs> the problem is that selection that you're mentioning without knowing what basis was, was it really because of what you said, the severity, or was it that they were closer to, or they were more familiar with that ambulatory unit? And so we don't know if what you're saying really applies. Absolutely. I just, I present a hypothesis and there are many possible explanations that might produce the difference. So I don't know going on. There's like a text in the chat that's coming from me. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on. Is this, I don't know if my thing is hacked. Yeah. I don't know. Is hacking uh, Zoom a thing? All right. Let's move on to the next part. <laughs> Now we're going to talk about the cross-examination. Um, before we move on, though, does anyone have anything else to add to the prompt study about their thoughts? Can, can you just the last slide, can you explain it again? Does it mean like when they just looked at the subgroups from community presentations, they actually didn't find a difference? Yes, but you have to remember that most patients did present to a hospital, not to a community uh, facility. It might, it might just be also underpowered. That's another argument. So the, the fact that uh, people went to the ambulatory center had uh, their their symptom to contact time was much larger, even though they had a shorter contact with treatment time. It kind of offsets the, the benefits there. So that's that's one thought, but again, it's not the same patient. You know, there is a selection uh, bias. These people called uh, the hotline beforehand, and they help direct them where to go. So that's another argument against that. And what we'll find out shortly is that, you know, symptom time does matter, and that's one of the studies that I have included. Uh, but before we move on, does anyone have anything else to add to the prompt study? Talk about in questions, do you or have what? any? Uh, if you think it, how uh, uh, do you, you think the issue is power? Uh, I do not think the issue is power. Uh, as to why the outcomes were not worse with, I think, what, what I do you think, think the issue is? I mean, outcomes with gram negatives are worse in every other place in the world other than Perth, Australia. 
that was another point uh, about table two. Again, I don't know if 150 patients is really representative of, uh, it's, it's probably representative for their specific population, but I don't think it will give us a direct answer about what's happening. The problem with this data that I find personally, and I'm really underwhelmed by it, and I actually have been <laughs> given the idea, listening to other people, that this was a very important study. <laughs> there are two main things. Number one, it's such a different population than the one that I deal with. I tend to have mostly patients who are ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, and I never heard of this so, such, well, not never, but the heart rate of peritonitis and the heart rate of mortality following within 30 days, 6% of the patient die within 30 days of having peritonitis. That is huge. So that has nothing really to do with our experience. And second, I cannot understand the difference between the CT time and the SC time. I mean, I understand what they mean, but why will they make any difference? So therefore, I cannot conclude anything. Therefore, though it is, makes sense that you have an infectious process, you should try to treat as soon as possible. That is always the case. I agree with that. But this study doesn't support anything in my mind. Um, just to sort of talk about the actual, the, the mortality rate here wasn't uh, 30%. It was about uh, 10 out of 158 episodes. Oh, I said 6%. Is, is, 30, uh, is how many people over the total? Um, so the other studies that I wanted to bring up was about, uh, was actually, the first study was about imaging. So they did a reanalysis of the patients that were included in the prompt study. And what they found was that imaging contributes to antimicrobial delays. They looked at 153 episodes of uh, peritonitis. 60 of them had uh, radiological exams. 41 of them had exams within presentation, the first 24 hours. Most of the exams were clinically unhelpful or normal, so about 85%. And uh, when they looked at you know, the patients who did get imaging ordered within the first 24 hours, there is about an hour delay, so 2.0 hours versus 2.93 hours uh, compared to the people who had imaging ordered. Uh, so essentially, in patients who had imaging ordered within 24 hours, for the people who did receive treatment before imaging, uh, treatment was initiated from contact within one and a half hours versus four and a half hours uh, when it was done after. The slide is to really just talk about the causes of abdominal pain in a PD patient. You know, PD patients have all of their other organs too. Um, not all abdominal pain is peritonitis. I don't want you guys to think that I'm saying don't order imaging. If you think it's clinically warranted, then do please order it. Um, but consider giving antimicrobials first if peritonitis is part of the differential before sending them off to the scanner. Um, so this was a study in Japan in 2021. And again, one of the big sort of negative aspects of the trial, which we talked about, is that it didn't really find an association between symptom time and treatment time. So time of onset of symptoms to time they got antimicrobials. This study in Japan did show a difference. And patients who, you know, uh, received treatment within 24 hours were more likely uh, to keep their peritoneal dialysis catheter and not redevelop peritonitis. The odds ratio is about 3.2. I'm sorry. Okay, moving on. Um, what's also interesting in this cohort is that only 40% complained of pain. So we just really have to be cognizant about a patient's cloudy effluent. Um, I actually like the study, contrary to everything that was said today. I think that, uh, again, it's only an observational trial. We can only infer associations and not causation, uh, but it was done really well. I think what they did was really impressive. They had pre-hospital uh, notification. They got their patients treated quicker. I think that the only way to truly get an answer would be to do a randomized clinical trial, but unfortunately, well, fortunately, that would be unethical. Um, 
I think that the only way to get a better answer of what's going on is to implement a change like what they did to your institute and then do a pre post cohort analysis and that way you can better estimate the effect size. I'd like someone else to look at other variables like hospital length of stay decision to admission and so on and so forth. Um, is this actionable data? I think, yes, it is. I think that we need to be treating peritonitis with the same urgency as, you know, acute coronary syndrome or stroke. We need to be not waiting for the cell counts to come back hours later. We should be treating empirically and de-escalating later. Um, and one question that I wanted to open up to the audience is your thoughts on home antimicrobials. Should patients, uh, you know, be taking? I'm, I, I'm against them. Did you? Would you? Did you want to wait, or did you want response to that now? I'd like your response, Doctor Goldberg. I I'm against it. What are you voting on? I, I mean, I agree with Dr. Golfer. I think, you know, patients might end up abusing it, not seeking medical care. You won't have any idea what organisms growing out that causes pressure and maybe an increased rate of fungal peritonitis. Uh, but it's something to think about, you know, should we be considering prescribing oral antibiotics to these patients? Should do they have a home antibiotic kit, especially if they're in more rural areas and environment? What's, what's so wrong with having them grab a sample and then having them take antibiotics? I think the, they can have they can have Levaquin and and uh, Keflex at home, and they okay. they grab a sample and then they, and then they just. Well, take what do you it. mean by grab a sample? Explain what you mean. I mean get a sample of their PD fluid. And do what with it? Have it have it to take to take, but that way you won't be affected by the antibiotics. Oh, have good, it to deliver, right, so, but you'll already. But you no, that's have, a, uh, that, you, that, you, that's a good point. That has to be done correctly. So in the old days, what we did is we said to the patients, just save the bag. Okay, don't even mess, just save that first bag. Well, what happens is after a couple of days, th those bags start to expand and we had some explode. <laughs> well, I don't want to wait a couple I'm of days. Dead serious. I'm talking about a few hours or, or the next well, morning. No, no, no. It's a lot of interference there. Just take would do that. I'm in favor, but they tend to not do that. I, I like I say, been there, done that, and we tried that, and we tried it. We, we this was 30 years ago. We did this. Maybe now with electronics the way they are, and people being in electronic communication with their center, may, maybe it could be done again. But, but how far? But how far are people in the, in Nashville? I mean, away. The PD patient, because the reality that I have here in New York, that everyone is close enough, so it makes no sense to do that. How far are some people in Nashville? Is that is that an important point? No, well, it is a good point, but I think where all this started was when John Moran uh, uh, ran the home dialysis program at the Davida, and uh, maybe Graham can respond. Um, the, the other argument against it, again, uh, PD fluids, pH is, you know, between five, five and a half, you can get a false negative cell count and fail to nail that diagnosis. How do you get a negative cell count by a low pH? No, no, NIAF means a uh, 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 culture, uh, but NIAF, the, the, uh, the pH within 30 minutes of being in the abdomen, the pH is up close to physiologic pH. It yeah. is, it's the, uh. Uh, the pH is 5.2 or 5.4 on the shelf, but within 30 minutes inside the. So it isn't that, but tonicity can do it. But but in the end, that it's the most common cause of no growth is either one, not enough bacteria in there because the solution didn't dwell long enough, or pre-existing antibiotics. Because uh, if the culturing technique is done correctly, which is the blood culture models, you you should be able to get uh, uh, an isolation. 80% of the time. Uh, and so if serotypus, and I, I use that in a 
very sense antibiotics are then all the more reason not to have antibiotics at home. Um, this is just a reminder of uh, the status from the USRDS. PD is not going anywhere. You know, we really need to do better at taking care of PD patients in the hospital. There are a lot of things that can cause delays to antimicrobial therapy. Some of them are patient related factors. You know, they might fail to recognize their symptoms early. They may fail to seek timely medical attention. There are things that can sort of affect the diagnosis of. Uh, PD-related peritonitis, uh, things that can affect treatment are delays in reporting. You know, if you send a salt count, it takes a while to come back. Or other sort of factors that are regarding nursing, physician, the pharmacy. So it's not one thing that needs to be tackled. It's a whole systems issue that we need to be able to um, sort of optimize to get our patients antimicrobials as soon as possible. Um, these are my final thoughts. I feel like most of the time, since imaging is not going to provide much value in peritonitis cases, if you really want to image, treat first, image later. Uh, don't wait for any, uh, don't wait hours for the cell count to result. If the effluent's cloudy, treat first, de escalate later. Um, and we just really need to try to get our in hospital PD care on par to what we provide in ambulatory care facilities. And- Sorry, what did you mean there by consider empiric therapy even if the effluent is not cloudy? What does that mean? What, how would you suspect peritonitis? Even if you have an effluent there, of course you don't have this account, but it's not cloudy to the, can you have peritonitis there? I mean, it's 95% specific, so ar arguably you might end up with one in 20 patients who doesn't present with a cloudy effluent. Really? So peritonitis, 20% of patients with peritonitis present... 5%, sorry, 5%. 5% of patients with peritonitis present with a PD fluid which is not cloudy. Are you sure what you're saying? Come on, that, that gives no, the news here. That one hour later it is. I mean, two hours later it is. It, you're not going to have peritonitis without cloudy fluid. Now, what they're saying is that at initial presentation, there actually may be pain without cloudiness, but, but it'll be cloudy real soon. Tom, real the, soon. The, the initial presentation, as we have said, is after the patient has symptoms. Patient don't pass by the emergency room. I said, hey, let me go and test my PD fluid. They have symptoms for a couple of hours. They come and get. And I, here there's I a statement that those patients can have a clear PD fluid. That's impossible. I, I, I agree with you want them treated with antibiotic for abdominal pain without cloudy fluid. I agree with you. To treat abdominal pain without cloudy fluid, you agree uh, and, to treat abdominal pain? And, what, and, oh, and I believe, I believe I mean, that what we should treat those people with is observation. I think they should be in the home unit and they should stay there. And two hours later, we'll check their fluid or, or four hours later. But I don't believe they should be given antibiotics either. I also don't okay. think it should be ignored. I think they should be observed very closely. Thank you. So yeah, so the, that point is not well taken, considering. Okay. The other option, the other point I think, or not as a point at all, but I would advise, instead of going to the hospital, if they all come to the clinic, because the hospital, they wait, it takes forever, you gotta talk, then the nurse doesn't know how to drain the fluid, then they send it off, it just takes forever. But if they come to our clinic, they're going to get, you're going to avoid, you're going to save many hours, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Rodby. And I think that's part of the, you know, uh, problem is that, you know, the care we provide at the hospital is not on par to what we provide in the home dialysis units. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> the care we provide in the emergency department, you know, they fail to recognize they might do something crazy like a paracentesis for the cell count and culture rather than just drain the belly. There are a lot of things uh, where we can improve with educating acute care providers. You, you, you want crazy? How about seeing air under the diaphragm, which most PD patients have, calling the surgeon and open the belly. How's that one for crazy? That's pretty bad. 
But I like, you know, I, I, I mean, ideally, there's no reason why they can't come to your, they, they can't arrive at your clinic with a bag of cloudy fluid or arrive at the ER with a bag of cloudy fluid. That saves a lot of time. And I think that's a real education point. And that can save a lot of time, especially in the ED. Um, Absolutely. Like the current process we have is the patient arrives to the ED. It takes time for them to get triaged and see an emergency provider. Emergency provider has to, you know, figure out that this is an emergency and consult nephrology. They have to put the order for the PD fluid uh, for the initial dwell if they're coming in dry. That needs to be communicated to the nurses. The pharmacy needs to place the bag. The nurse needs to pick up the bag, go down to the ED, do the fill. She waits two hours. You know, if she gets busy, we get the salt count and culture drawn a little bit later. I don't hear whether or not, you know, visual inspection of the fluid is positive or not, whether it's cloudy. Um, so I don't know what my threshold is to treat. Uh, it's, it's hard and we need to do better is the point of this, I guess. You're, in your introduction, you said, you know, how uh, frightened or whatever the term you used uh, when you see a patient with PD. You know, I don't, I don't know, maybe you're seeing a little bit of a biased uh, population that end up in the hospital or end up sicker because there are a lot of patients that show up the clinic and we treat them and they do fine and they're not at a high risk. Um, it doesn't, you know, I never want a patient to have peritonitis, but, you know, there's a lot of them that it, it really doesn't have to be that big a deal. The amazing thing to me is how different pain is. And I used to think it was diabetics. Maybe they didn't, have a, they didn't feel the pain because of neuropathy. But I have found no correlation, well, little correlation with pain, organism, cell count, everything else. You just can't predict. But a lot of them do pretty well. And, you know, in the Japanese study, only 40% present presented with pain. So Only 40% presented with? Pain. Pain, wow. Well, so, nice that just graph. adds to your point. Nice graph. Nice, nice job, by the way. Uh, so again, sorry about the rocky start uh, to home dialysis um, conference. I did not expect we got to get hacked like this. Uh, thank you all for staying in and listening. Thank you all for your words of wisdom and comments. And thank you all for teaching me a thing or two. Uh, I just wanted to shout out my uh, mentor, Dr. Shami. He has a keen interest in improving in-hospital peritoneal dialysis. Please email him. Uh, if you want to collaborate on something.